before I hand over to Carol, um, who's going to do the talk today, she's asked me to just begin proceedings with a very short film which talks about enzymes. Now, enzymes are important because you'll recall in the title of this talk, it's called ELISA, which is, of course, an acronym. And the E in ELISA stands for enzymes. And Carol suggested we have a look at this short video first because it explains in simple, simplistic terms, really, how enzymes work. And it really is the key to understanding what the ELISA system actually does and how it works. So I'm going to run this short film. It runs for about five minutes. And then after that, I'll hand over to Carol, who's going to launch into the talk proper. So if you bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, everybody should now be able to see a little um, cartoon characters and the word enzymes. Is that okay? Can everyone see that? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, okay. I'm going to run the film. It runs about five minutes and then um, I'll stop and hand over to Carol. Okay. So, where are we? Um... Is it odd to have a favorite protein? Well, I don't think so. Probably because my favorite protein happens to remind me of one of my favorite childhood games, Pac-Man. If you haven't played Pac-Man before, then chances are we're much, much older than you. But now you can play it on Google. Just Google Pac-Man. It's a Google Doodle. Anyway, I digress. But see, in Pac-Man, you have this little character. It goes around, finds these pebbles, and the pebbles fit right into it. Well, a lot of illustrations that you will find of enzymes, they happen to look, at least us, a lot like Pac-Man. I remember P for Pac-Man and P for protein. Most enzymes are proteins. Now, in the game, we mentioned there are these little pebbles that Pac-Man goes after. Well, enzymes have a specifically shaped area called an active site where items can bind. The items are called substrates. It's very specific binding because the active site is specifically shaped for the substrate that binds there. Very specific. So what happens when a substrate binds an enzyme? Well, usually the substrate is held there with some weak bonds because it's not going to stay there forever. And something called induced fit will happen, which means the active site can change its shape even more to bind that substrate, like an enzyme substrate hug. The enzyme can either build up or break down the substrates that specifically bind to it, and we call the resulting item the product. An enzyme has the ability to really speed up reactions. Reactions that technically could happen on their own, but with the help of enzymes, they can be sped up to make processes effective for life. Let me give you a great real life example. The enzyme lactase. Another really cool thing about enzymes is that they often end in ASE, like lactase. And many sugars, on the other hand, end in OSE. And lactose is an example of a sugar. Lactose is a disaccharide, meaning it contains two sugar molecules bound together. We don't actually digest it so well in that form. It's big. The enzyme lactase has the ability to break lactose down into smaller parts that our body can digest. And this is a lot better option than waiting for a chemical reaction with lactose to happen spontaneously. Now, with the lactase enzyme, lactose can be broken down quickly and digested. Now, there are some people that do not produce enough lactase. They can be what we call lactose intolerant, which means that if they consume foods that have lactose, such as milk, it can make them sick. They can't break the lactose down efficiently without lactase. In that example, one thing to point out, lactase, the enzyme, can break down a lot of lactose, the substrate. The lactase doesn't get used up in the reaction. It's still there. We call enzymes a catalyst because they can be used over and over and over and over in the reaction. By the way, your digestive system uses all kinds of enzymes. You have lipase, and that breaks down lipids, which are fats. You have amylase, which breaks down starch. You have protease, which breaks down proteins. So as you can see, the digestive system is very involved with enzymes. Another thing to point out is that Enzymes don't always work alone. Sometimes they get some help. 
Some often underappreciated but essential little helpers are called cofactors and coenzymes. They may bind to the substrate or to the active site. They help the enzyme do its job of building up or breaking down substrates into products. Now, you didn't forget our Pac-Man analogy yet, right? In the game Pac-Man, there are these ghosts. And when they touch the Pac-Man, it makes this sound. It's like... No, 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 no. And the Pac-Man shape gets all distorted in the process. So what does this have to do with enzymes? No, there aren't ghosts around. But enzymes do have certain ideal conditions that they like. For example, an enzyme that is in your stomach would have an ideal pH that is very acidic because the environment in your stomach is very acidic. Different enzymes have different ideal pH and temperature ranges. If an environment changes out of an enzyme's ideal pH or temperature range, then something that reminds me a lot of that horrible sound I tried to make can happen. The enzyme becomes denatured. That means its shape becomes distorted. It can no longer bind to its substrate. It can no longer work correctly. It is finished. Well, that's a dramatic end to enzymes. Keep in mind that if you have an interest in this topic, many medical researchers have a large focus on enzymes. Enzymes regulate a lot of the body processes, and many diseases can involve specific enzyme production or the lack of it. Well, that's it for the Amoeba Sisters, and we were Okay. I'll stop it there because it's just a little follow-up that um, that we don't need to see. Hope that helped to um, kind of set the scene for some of what Carol's going to speak about now. So without further ado, I'll, I'll just hand over to Carol, um, who's going to tell us all about Lisa. So take it away, Carol. Okay. Uh, I thought I'd actually let you know what the acronym is at the beginning. Uh, Elisa, Elisa, people say different things. And I discovered that actually it's changed its name over the years because when I first started, it was an enzyme ligand immunosorbent assay. And all it, a ligand is just something that's linked to some, uh, uh, something um, in biochemical terms. And it became enzyme linked immunosorbent assay. And now it appears to be enzyme linked immunoassay, but they're all, oh, oh yeah, Elisa's, oh, I've managed to miss the um, essay, haven't I? They're all Elisa's. Um, so that's just, that's the acronym. And after that, I'm hoping this isn't going to have jargon in it. Because when um, we first set this up and there was a little survey, 40% of the people didn't have a, I'm going to say a STEM background, a science or technical background, but they're people who are interested in science and technology. And so I want to talk, if you'd like to, um, the, the, the um, intelligent layman. But in reality, of all of us here, we're nearly all just intelligent laymen because I know nothing about astrophysics. I know loads about certain areas of biochemistry, and I know there are loads of areas of biochemistry I know nothing about. So to me, we're all intelligent laymen, and we're going to do some basic protein chemistry today because that's what makes me tick. Um, I, I, was, I was brought up in a household where they were engineers or medics, but it just happened that my brother and I were absolutely fascinated by science. and. Um, I particularly loved chemistry and then at 17 I discovered organic chemistry and just fell in love with the uh, chemistry of the carbon atom as you do and uh, ended up going to Bath University where I did a four-year applied biochemistry degree. Then I came to Cardiff where I've been ever since to do a PhD in microbial enzymology. Uh, did another three years in academia did what women did in those days and gave up their job to raise their children. So I was at home for nearly 18 years, raising our five kids. Um, my eldest was going off to uni. We needed more of an income. And I was able to get a job in an immunodiagnostics manufacturer, which is what I'd always wanted to do, was to work in industry and somewhere that actually generated 
money instead of the public sector where it's just consumed. Uh, that's, I don't know why it makes me tick, but it does. And I ended up in the senior management team of uh, a small company, an SME, a small to medium, small to medium enterprise with 150 employees. Um, and we specialised in producing assays for autoimmunity, mainly thyroid autoimmunity and diabetes, but other specialist kits. Um, and I ended up as quality manager of a spin-off company that was um, develop, developing one of our monoclonal antibodies for therapeutic use. So I got um, found out all about MHRA registration and all the requirements for producing um, th you know, the antibody for therapeutic use. Um, and it was really interesting. I, I retired just as we got through the, um, the toxicity testing, the, the, the phase one and phase two clinical trials. And uh, to be honest, I had a ball, uh, but it was time to retire. And I'm just having a different sort of ball these days with my grandchildren and stuff like this. Uh, so, if you like, that's just me, because I often wonder when people talk just what their background is, because it's not always obvious. And in biochemistry, you're generally dealing with very, very small quantities, very small concentrations. Because in, in, in the um, advert that went out, it's talking about measuring samples from human fluids, blood, urine. Uh, and when you're looking for proteins, as I always will be, it's quite a challenge to measure them at the very low quantities. And the other thing is, everybody goes on about DNA and the miracle of DNA. Well, DNA is just a mechanical thing. The, the, the miraculous bit is the way that proteins are actually produced from it and fold and our life is sustained by proteins uh, there, there, there are proteins in the, the walls of the cell that transport ions in, in and out and other essential substances you have enzymes which are proteins which bring about the chemical reactions at body temperature without without the enzymes you would have to be doing the reactions at probably hundreds of degrees centigrade, but the miracle of an enzyme is it will do it at body temperature. So I'm very much into protein chemistry. But what I've got here is the um, biochemical orders of magnitude. I mean, it's any order of magnitude, but it's the, it's the concentrations I've always been used to dealing with in my working life. Um, so these are the SI units that everybody uses for concentrations, the amount of a substance in a liquid. And I looked up some examples there. Um, so one molar, 10 to the zero. Uh, and then if you dilute it 10 times less than that, 10 to the minus one is decimolar, 10 to the minus two is centimolar. I didn't bother looking anything up there because I, you just never ever use it in biochemistry ever. Probably use it in chemistry. Um, then you start getting into um, the world that I lived in. Uh, so you go down at 10 to the minus three millimolar. And I had a look up and approximately 650 millimolar is the concentration of salt in seawater. And then you go down another threefold thousand and you get to micromolar and 180 to 450 micromolar is a normal range of uric acid in blood you go down another thousand another threefold and you get to nanomolar and there are 101 that's should say nanomolar there hydroxide ions in pure water at 25 degrees c water is essentially made up of, of a OH hydroxide and then the H ions that, that they're about they are bound together but there's a sort of separation within the molecule but 
obviously you're at molecular level there. And then you go down another threefold and you get to picomolar, which 170 picomolar is the upper limit for healthy insulin. Um, so I, my, I see if I can move my, there we go, um, when fasting. And, uh, and then another threefold down to femtomolar, 10 to the minus 15. You get two femtomoles bacteria in surface seawater. Now, that is something I got off the internet. I would have thought it varies vastly. And if you've got a sewage output nearby, it's going to be huge. <laughs> but it's just really show the sort of orders of magnitude that in biochemistry that you're dealing with. Um, let me just, yeah, I, let me come on to this one. I had a look at um, fasting glucose levels. Now, if there are any medics out there and know that they're different, you're just going to have to excuse me. But this is what I found on the internet. And it was all, and I had to convert it all into millimolar and micromolar. And it's an illustration. It's not an absolute, but it, it's the right order of magnitude. And uh, so fasting glucose levels in human serum if it's less than, I'm going to go to the, the 500 micromolar, then it's, not, it's normal. If it's in the range 560 to 690 micromolar, you're pre-diabetic. And if it's greater than 700 micromolar, you're considered diabetic. Now, there are two sorts of assay. In the old days, there was radioimmunoassay using radioactive isotopes, which people don't like using these days, and uh, moved, uh, moved on to ELISAs. And a typical ELISA will, will measure in the air region of, I say in there, 0 to 3.75 millimolar of whatever analyte has, has been chosen for that particular test. Now, a typical radioimmunoassay will measure much lower than that. It's 30 times more sensitive. Um, so, you know, the world's moved on, but we've actually moved on to um, tests which are less sensitive. And because I was involved in manufacturing industry, I can tell you I would much rather deal with the radioactive isotopes than I would with some of the chemicals that go into it, elisas such as tetramethylbenzidine, which is particularly nasty, but produces a color change, which you'll find out later that we need. Um, so it really means that a RIA will detect um, at micromolar levels rather than millimolar, and certain RIAs will actually go down to femtomolar levels reliably. Um, I, I've most certainly measured at that level and been very confident that I was measuring something real. But people don't like radioactivity, so we've gone, from my point of view, in some ways backwards, to be honest, but there you go. Um, so here, sorry, where they're black and white slides, they're ones I've um, done myself, where they're lovely colours, I've managed to get things off Google Images, so <laughs> I'm a very basic person. Um, I can't do uh, w w with graphics and stuff. I'm, I'm just interested in what's in it, as opposed to how pretty it looks. Now, there are, to do with protein chemistry, there are two principles in a basic ELISA. There is the e enzyme ligand or enzyme linked element, and uh, there's another typo, and um, which the amoeba sisters told us all about. And as Barry and uh, Steve and I had been talking about the wonders of Pac-Man, when I found that, I thought it was absolutely superb, absolutely superb. And then there's an immunoassay element, which is, involves an antibody antigen inter interaction. And these days, I'm sure everybody's heard about antibody and antigens and immuno, immunoassay, immunochemistry, immunology because of COVID. You know, we, 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 and, and we've moved into a world where a lot of the science I'm interested in is suddenly mainstream and people who never even had heard of the words now use them quite regularly, like spike protein. <laughs> um, 
So I'm going to go through each one of these now. Um, so it is. Oh, right. I've, let me just. All right. Let me just check something. Right. OK, I've done it in the opposite. Direction. Let me just do it this way. Um, no, no, I'll do it this way. Right. The immunoassay element. I think the vast majority of us will know that the antibodies which our body produces and also um, the vaccines that we produce recognize the spike protein on the outside of the COVID. Um, here we've got pathogen. And also, I think we, we will all be aware that that gradually evolves and the um, vaccines aren't so effective and then they have to be tweaked to become effective again. But basically, and I'm not worried about things like FC receptor effector cell. All I'm interested here is the antibody and the pathogen with the green bits stuck on it. Um, because that is a typical antibody that's produced in all our bodies. We produce two sorts. There are just general antibodies which are always circulating. And then when a particular pathogen comes along and attacks us, the body adapts and produces specific antibodies for that. And, uh, and th this antibody antigen, because that pathogen is the antigen, um, so with COVID, the spike protein is the antigen. That is essential for an ELISA to work. Um, so, and that would be the first stage of an ELISA. Now, the second stage is actually the, what we saw the amoeba sisters describe very expertly. Um, and this is just a very simple model. It's called the lock and key model. Now, I was taught this back in 1970. Two. My daughter Anne went to Oxford in 2010 and I said, what do they call it now? And she said, the lock and key model. <laughs> so at least some things don't change. Um, so th this is a schematic version of what we had all singing and dancing earlier. Um, as I said, an enzyme will catalyze a chemical reaction at body temperature. Once you get up to about 45, 50 degrees centigrade, the enzyme, because it's a protein, will begin to denature and not work, which is why if you have a washing powder with enzymes in, do not do use it in hot water because it's a waste of time. Um, and why actually it quite likes to be about 30 degrees um, because that's what it's used to, if it's, well, unless it's in a lizard. Um, but in, in a mammal, 37 degrees is the operating temperature. So what you have is a substrate, the reactant, the substance that you want to be changed in some way in a chemical reaction. And it enters the active site of the enzyme. Enzymes are proteins. As we know, sometimes you get um, metal ions in them. Sometimes you get vitamins in them to help the uh, catalysis. But essentially you have a protein that's folded in a specific way. Proteins are just strings of 20 or so amino acids, very simple chemicals, um, but each one with different um, sort of ch ch chains on the basic structure. And the, the, the so the, the bait for the amino acid, I'm sorry, I haven't got an illustration for this, that they just cause the proteins to fold into specific shapes. You get pleated sheets and then you get coils. And it's quite fantastic the way that proteins fold. And sometimes you get more than one unit in them as well. But this is just a very simple model. And with all the folding that's created by the amino acids, binding with each other non valently i.e. there are no chemical bonds between the amino acids, it's just the interactions of, of the um, natural plus and minus polarities within each molecule. 
um, but it creates a lovely little site that the substrate tucks into and it becomes an enzyme substrate complex. And then a chemical reaction is triggered by the enzyme. Now this binding is different from that of an antigen and an antibody because as the substrate binds, there is what is called a conformational change. It's just a change of shape, but it brings certain reactive groups within the substrate closer together so that they react. And once they've done that, you get the two products that you see coming off there and the enzyme will then go back to its normal shape, waiting for another substrate to come along and in this case be chopped in two. Um, and this is also an essential part of an ELISA reaction. So how does a basic ELISA work? Well, you basically have a plastic, a tiny little plastic well, 250 microliters of fluid is the standard size. And you'll see later in some pictures, a standard, you get standard 96 well ELISA plates. But, it's, but um, proteins absorb onto the plastic. They just do. It, it, it's it's uh, another way proteins work. So what you start off with is your antibody that you coat the plate with. Number one, the capture antibody. And it's stuck to the plate and anything that sticks to it stays stuck to the plate. You then have your target antigen, which here, it could be the spike protein. Um, well, say it is because I'm, I haven't had a chance to look it up because my phone died at the wrong moment, but I'm pretty certain a PCR test is it what well, once you've um, amplified the amount of uh, spike protein in the sample, it then goes into an ELISA test. Um, so you have your target antigen, which will, stick to the capture antibody, simply lock and key, simple as that. But they're binding sites, appropriate amino acid, acids, and it just sticks to it. So, I mean, at this point, because you, you, you're using various buffers, various solutions to optimize the binding, appropriate pH, appropriate temperature, you literally just wash it. And um, I mean, I've done it and we just used to invert it on at uh, basic level, just onto some tissue, just to get out any liquid because we didn't want it for the next bit. Um, and you turn it over and then you go to three, which is where our enzyme comes in. Again, a lock and key, it sticks to the target antigen because it's on an antibody, but that antibody has got the enzyme that is required for this. Now that enzyme is often horseradish peroxidase, which just um, is an oxidase basically. <laughs> Enzymes are really simple. They're all something ases. And as, as you know, she had lipases and amylases, but so you can generally tell from the name of the enzyme, what did I ligase breaks things into two. Um, but this is generally horseradish peroxidase, and that is useful because in the presence of tetramethylbenzidine, which is an extremely nasty yellow toxic chemical, it changes it from yellow to dark blue. as long as you have the substrate there for it to happen. So, because the whole point in an assay is you have to produce something measurable. So in an ELISA, it's, or LISA, it's a color change. In a RIA, a radioimmunoassay, you can measure the amount of uh, radioactivity bound. And so all along the way, you're washing and adding, washing and adding, washing and adding. But basically what this is showing is that you've had your target antigen that you're trying to measure, and then you're ending up with the substrate being changed into the red stars 
which can be measured. And what you do is you have a calibration curve where you have known, known concentrations of what you want to measure. And from zero, let, let's say we're going up to two millimolar on this particular one. So you'd probably have zero, 30, 60, 100, 150, 200 millimolar. And from that color change, you can construct a calibration curve and then any unknown samples, you can have a look at what their color change is and read it off the calibration curve. I will go through that now, but that's how a basic ELISA works. So this is where the um, Barry and Steve's uh, pictures have come in very usefully. That is what a 96 well ELISA plate looks like. Just you, this is how I would do it in the laboratory. In real, in real life, in a hospital laboratory, they have auto analyzers, massive machines which just do it automatically. And they have tiny little um, thin tubes that dip into each patient sample and suck it into the machine. And the machine automatically does what I've told you, but I actually couldn't copy the image of what that looks like. And it would, it would only just look like a machine anyway, to be honest. But so that is what I used to do day in, day out for about five years before they released me into an office and I could tell people what to do and just enjoy interpreting the results and then asking them to do something else. So there, if you like, you're, there you're at a stage where the sample's gone in, you, you, you've had your second antibody go on with the horseradish uh, peroxidase. That, this actually is a different one because you've got a blue color there as opposed to a yellow color. But that doesn't matter. The whole point there is everything is a consistent color because there hasn't been any reaction yet to produce the calibration curve and therefore to give you a chance to, well, then for you to measure the color change and for you to read your unknown samples of the calibration curve. Here, you can see there's a color change. Some of the wells are clear. The ones on the right are very darkly colored. And I mean, I know from looking at that, that the calibrators go from the middle to the right, because you can see increasing concentrations of your analyte, what you're wanting to measure. And the ones on the left will be the samples, which will be read off the calibration curve. And that's put in a spectrophotometer, an ELISA plate reader, and you end up with something like this for the data analysis. So whatever happens, you always get a bit of a color change. So we start off with a blank. And notice for this particular one, you're in picograms per mil, so you're at very low levels. But we're not in molars, but picograms are also very, very small amounts. And you've got... 001, 002, so it's been done in duplicate. We always did it in triplicate because in three, three samples of each, um, the blank and each of the standards, the calibrators in each sample, because if you do it in duplicate and they're completely different, which one is right? If you do it in triplicate, three samples and two are like that and the other one's 0 0.250, you know you've done something wrong and you eliminate it. So hospitals will do this because it's cheaper but for all our quality control in the labs it was done in at least um triplicate so that we could guarantee that we knew what we were reading and then you've got the average of the two because of course this is a wonderful elisa assay with no mistakes in it whatsoever <laughs> and then they've taken off the blank the point one seven four the background color you always get anyway. And you've got your green column there of the corrected um, average optical densities, which is what the spectrophotometer measures. And you'll see you've got standard one to standard seven there. With that, they will construct a calibration curve. And then at the bottom, you've got sample one with an average of 
0.087, sample 2, 0.588, and sample 3, 0.251. And because you can construct a graph with standards um, along the x-axis, and you've got your corrected optical densities on the y-axis, you then, then read the unknowns because the highest standard is 2.482, and your sample one, the highest concentration is 1.087. So that's a very nice little curve there. Um, and that basically is how most hospital laboratories measure all sorts of biological samples, at incredibly low levels that we just take for granted. And th that, I've, is what has made me tick all my life and still does, because I think it's, it's some really basic protein chemistry there that is very, very exciting stuff, and to me, miraculous. And, and I'll just sort of finish it by saying that what really got me in, I mean, I'm a, I am a Christian, and you know, people sort of say, oh, you look at the universe and the stars, and they're amazing, or you'll get a doctor saying, oh, the human body is just so fantastic. But for me, in organic chemistry, it is the way the chemical reactions go to convert a polysaturated carbon chain to an unsaturated carbon chain that made me realise that there's something there that designed that because it is just incredible. <laughs> and with that, I say, if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, but that's how, that's is so uh, the, I'm hoping out of all that the only um, acronym you got was ELISA and I didn't use anything too um, fancy and misunderstood that you couldn't understand because we are all here just in, intelligent laymen whether we've got a science background or not Thank you very much, Carol. Really appreciated that. And uh, it's given me uh, an additional insight, I think, into uh, how these instruments work. I Just looking in the chat box at the moment, um, no specific question, but I, I have one, actually. I've got one of these um, uh, diabetic uh, uh, finger prick um, yeah. home measurement devices. And yeah. it seems to me that that must be measuring a change in electrical conductivity. Is that right? Yes, it will. It will. I mean, it's quite fantastic what's available these days for diabetics. Um, yes, yes, it will. Um, and they're very, very accurate and, as well. But, but oh. notice it's not biochemistry, it's physics. <laughs> oh, that's, my, that's more it's my electrical style. conductivity so it's not my field that's more my style that's great yeah. um yeah. yes but i understand all about colorimetry and so on but mm, obviously yeah. that's that's a bit too sophisticated for home use but, yes, um, yeah. what, but what, so, I'm, what i'm staggered about is the um it's a very small um quantities we're dealing with and mm. Can I assume that the glucose levels that the, the finger prick test measures is indeed in micromolars, millimolars, sorry? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for biochemistry, millimolar is huge. Yeah, so the, <laughs> no, I mean, they, are, they are calibrated in millimolars. Yes, yeah, and yeah. It's not just the, the, the reading instrument that uh, is important, it's the test strip itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tests have to, yeah, yeah. Ha ha have to yeah. be fall within certain manufacturing um, yeah. limits, presumably, and that's what makes them quite yeah. expensive. If you have Extre to extremely expensive. I mean, the kits, we didn't have any kit that was less than $250 a kit. Mm. Um, I'm just going to say something, as isn't aren't the questions, I can say something about diabetes um, because an awful lot has been learned about it in the last 10 years. Um, you know, because originally you had type 1 and type 2 diabetes. You know, pe people, type 1 was autoimmune a disease. Often you work got it very young and then you had something called adult onset diabetes type 2 
which was often part of metabolic disease because people had awful di um, diets and became insulin resistant. It's not as clear cut it as, as it appears since people started to look at the immunology of it all. So my company, we sold three kits for diabetes testing to, to help diagnose and then monitor progress of the disease. What we didn't want was a cure because then they wouldn't need to buy our kits. Yeah. But we're not there. Hopefully we might be one day, but we're not there. So mm -hmm. the original, because so, so basically, if we take type 1 diabetes classically, the islet cells in the pancreas, which produce the insulin, get destroyed by antibodies. And the, the first one discovered was the GAD65 antibody, glutamic acid decarboxylase, which obviously is an enzyme involved actually in the um, release of insulin because there's a precursor insulin in the cell and it will, will um, it's, well, it takes, a, it takes a, a carboxyl atom off decarboxylase and, and the insulin can be released into the bloodstream. It was then discovered that there was another antibody to a protein in the, in the cell wall called IA2. And this too was involved in the release of insulin and you would get antibodies attaching to the set pro, this protein in the cell wall. And then much more recently, it was discovered that there were antibodies to a transport of the zinc into the islet cell. ZNT8, ZN, zinc transporter 8 protein. Mm. Um, so that, that, so that, that again was a pore and zinc. I, mean, I, I, I don't know that, that much about it, but obviously is that there is a requirement for the transport of zinc through the cell wall yeah. as part of the release of insulin. Now, there have been studies done looking at the levels of these antibodies. Um, in families where there's a predisposition to diabetes. So there's sort of a generational study and they've gone on for some time and there are these antibodies or some of these antibodies can be found in the normal child or adult. And then slowly they change and they can be seen from the balance of the antibodies that they're becoming pre-diabetic and then they change again and they become diabetic. And, you know, it's very, very useful for, for actual monitoring of what is going on in a family where they do have sort of mm. gen generational diabetes because you can help, if you like, the, the yeah. kids coming on from getting too ill before... Yeah. they get their diabetes. Now, it can only be controlled, but however, well-controlled diabetes is a gift. Mm. I'm sure those of you who have it know. Yeah, it's a tipping point. Mm, that's right, that's right. So, um, it, and that, that's only been development in the last sort of, 10 years, but it's quite mm. fascinating the way things are going on that you can't see yeah. but at, at, at a molecular level. Also, there is an autoimmune element to type 2 diabetes, there's something in between okay. the two. And, and that's very interesting. It is not clear cut like it's made out to be. But to be honest, unless you are a diabetes expert, it really doesn't matter whether you know that or not. And of course, you get gestational diabetes as well, which can be very, very miserable mm. for a pregnant mum and in the time afterwards. Is so, that so. Yeah, so that, that's just my comment about diabetes and autoimmun you know, autoimmunity, that it's no longer as clear-cut as it was. Okay, thank you, Carol. Um, the questions are flooding in now. Um, Jeff Barrett, how many tests can you do from one blood sample? I'm tempted to say it depends how many gallons you take. <laughs> <laughs> However, however, the lowest amount I've seen as a suitable sample size, and it, this is generally um, serum. Um, plasma may interfere with the test because of the collating agents, i.e. The, the, the chemicals put in to take out the um, yeah. metal ions that you don't want there that would interfere 
well, well they, inter they interfere with clotting. They, it's to do with clotting of samples, basically. Yes. And um, for plasma, you have to put in collating agents to stop it clotting. Yeah. Whereas serum just clot is clots and you spin off the clot and then use the clear serum. Yes. Um, but the lowest volume I've seen is two microliters, which is extremely small. Given the cells are 250 microliters, but that's got to take uh, at any one point, whatever liquids you're putting in, um, usually it's between 25, 20 and 100 microliters would be a normal sample size. So you'd get, so from one mil, if you do it well, you can get eight samples. Well, sorry, no, you, no, sorry, eight, you get 60, you probably get 20 samples depending on the sample size. So because in a clinical biochemistry lab, you know, there, there are obviously regulations about how they're handled, I'm especially getting the right patient attached to the right result. Um, they will always be stored um, generally at minus 70 because of their proteins. Oh, so it, people can always go back and reanalyze it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. John and Judith uh, ask a question here. I understand the numbers for OD1 and OD2, mm. uh, but I don't get the corrected result, but they've come back. Uh, uh, they don't, well, they don't they, they, get they, they, the they, I, I, Yeah. I, uh, I mean, from my memory, because I'm not looking at the PowerPoint. You, it was the same. You have two ODs for the two, two samples of your unknown. Yeah. And then you add them together and take the average of it. Yeah. And then you take off the blank from the top. Which is which the is, background. Which is, like, which is the background colour change. Yeah. To give you an absolute colour change so that when you put, and you do exactly the same with all the calibration curves or the standards, yeah. Yeah. so you get an accurate measurement. Because if you didn't do the correction, it would be too high. Well, it just it wouldn't be accurate because a calibration curve wouldn't be the right shape. Okay. Basically. Okay. Uh, one one for here from John and Celia. We read a lot recently about AlphaFold, the AI mm. software which can predict protein folding. Mm. Will this extend the range of ELISA tests that can be done? Um. I mean, I've read about that, and what they don't say is whether the proteins that they produce are actually active. Ah. Uh, I don't think they've got there yet. Right. Um, I don't think it would make... So, I, I mean, I'm thinking on my feet. I'm trying to think why it would change anything. Because all, all the way in this, you're dealing with actual real-life mm. body samples taken from a human body. So... It, it, it could be useful, if you like, in producing proteins that, that that's, well, per, 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 perhaps the, um, the enzyme part of it. Yeah. Um, but, but, but it's a long, long way from being able, like, I, I think, from what I've read, to producing an actual protein that does the job it's supposed to do in the body. Yeah. You know, be it a transport through a membrane or catalyzing an enzyme reaction. Um, and of course, with DNA um, chemistry, it's all proteins that do the work. I mean, it's quite miraculous, really. It's, it's very chicken and egg. You know, how, how did the proteins arrive to do all the modifications to the DNA when the DNA codes for the proteins? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and in recent years also with DNA, there's this thing called epigenetics, which there are all sorts of modifications to DNA that control it that were never known. When I did it, my DNA biochemistry, they wasn't known yeah. anything about it. And yet there are sugars and proteins which are bound to it that modify how it works. And, and that's a field of epigenetics that never existed when I did my studying. Okay, thank you, Carol. Uh, Diane Yule has a quite a long question in the chat box, um, so I think I'll, I'll let her talk to you directly about that uh, a little bit okay. later. Um, right, Jane, in Britain, um, you've got your hand up. Would you like to unmute? Um, yes, thanks, Barry. Um, I've got a. Uh, I worked in a. I was a user, Carol. Yeah. <laughs> 
I was a user <laughs> what? for 60 years, um, yeah. 40 years, sorry, not 60, um, yeah. of um, Eliza's in a yeah. pathology lab in yeah. serology, virology. I have yeah. a couple of pictures of our auto uh, analyzers, yeah. if I could share. The oh, please, please do. You're the gift I wanted. For, for just a second. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let me just allow you, you can, to If you can help, but, yeah. yeah. Hang on. Uh, right. Okay, Jane, you should be able to share. There we are. Yeah. That is um, an auto analyzer that was uh, used in serology to uh, do ELISA tests for um, uh, looking for <laughs> antibodies to HIV, hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus. Um, the microteter plates fit in here. We could mm. uh, test about 90 spec patient specimens with the controls that Carol has explained. Um, all the uh, reactions, they come as a kit, you know, a, a big bottle of them, and they get fed into the machine. Um, and this machine runs, I mean, the, each ELISA test takes... Uh, several hours. There's an incubator in there as well, and a spectrophotometer to use to um, uh, uh, measure the color change at the end. Um, the um, plate, the microteter wells, you can have a whole plate, which is 96 wells, um, and the individual, uh, or you can just have strips of them to, to do smaller runs, but normally they're much larger, much larger runs, and the reagents go in, in here. Um, as far as um, keeping um, uh, specimen and results together, all the um, blood samples that are taken nowadays have uh, uh, numbers with barcodes on, and there are barcode readers in the um, in the machine as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's a, 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 a device for uh, sucking up, uh, delivering small amounts. And mm -hmm. we're talking 100 microliters here yes. of yes. serum that is collected. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, oh, that's a, a different, uh, that's the uh, VIDAS, which is uh, a different format of ELISA where each individual uh, kit has is run through a machine and you put the uh, patient specimen mm. uh, in the end there. Um, mm. So I thought you might uh, find those interesting. That, that, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. I was going to say there's been a tendency to try and um, d develop ELISA tests, which are a lot faster. Um, so, I mean, a typical one of ours would be two and a, well, two and a, two hours um but we did have one that was complete in an hour and, and of course for the, the lateral flow tests have as they've asked in the chat have developed on from elisa onto membrane technology rather yeah, than yeah, in a yes. liquid phase yeah yeah so yes, it's yes, all yes. the sandwich technique of antibody yes. antigen yeah yeah that, that's uh, over yes, and yes, over yes. again and yes. then a, a a measurement at the end yeah yeah what i was going to say was um in um Japan, they have hospitals dedicated to certain diseases, and people will go 200 miles to one. They, 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 they don't do cottage hospitals and district general hospitals. But because we used to sell products to um, a particular centre, and they ran, a, a, I mean, our direct competitor when I was there was Roche. Which was massive, and we oh, were yes. little. Yeah. However, because we had um, patented monoclonal antibodies that they needed, not only did we sell them to them for a vast amount of money, we also got royalties on them. Um, but they had so these hospitals. For this is for thyroid disease, autoimmune thyroid disease, Graves' disease, which is hyperthyroidism where people run around like sticking tits at 90 miles an hour and chat and look as thin as anything and tired or um, Hashimoto's disease hypothyroidism where people are like sloths and people can be very cruel because I have a friend with hypothyroidism and it is not well controlled it never has been for whatever reason because we do actually have an expert center at uhw for it but for her it wasn't working and she struggles to lose two pounds 
weight, you know, in three months. And everything she does is sort of slow because everything is working slow. Um, I, it's not, th thyroid disease is not nice and it is not as well controlled as people think. But in Japan, they have these one-stop hospitals. So you arrive there at seven o'clock in the morning, they'll take blood samples and that you'll, you'll see the specialist. They'll, they'll run all the tests while you're there. You will get a diagnosis and you will come out at the end of the day with whatever drugs are needed to start your treatment. Um, we wouldn't do that here because everybody wants their own hospital around the corner, but they are amazing, actually. But, uh, pathology services are amalgamating right, left and centre. Mm. Reading has lost most of its pathology lab, which mm. has been amalgamated with mm. Frimley. Local yeah. labs have oh, yeah. amalgamated. It's yeah. huge yeah. Look, numbers now. Oh, I'm, I'm aware of that, but these are actually dedicated to, you know, thyroid disease or to certain cancers or to certain aspects of cardiac problems, which, which we, we, we don't organise like that in this country. And I have a feeling the Japanese do what they're told <laughs> to a large extent, and we don't. But it is quite extraordinary that if, if you have the resources, what you can do in one day, which in this country could take months, unfortunately. Quite but right. it, Yeah. And I'm not advocating it. I'm just saying there are different systems. Yeah. Thank you, Jane, for um, those pictures. Wonderful. Thank you for um, uh, popping those up. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Barrett, you've been patient with your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question about the number of tests was more about the number of types of tests rather than anything else. Oh. So I've got an oh, autoimmune. Sorry. Yeah, I've got an autoimmune disease, yes. um, Sjogren's syndrome. Just open my curtains. I'm looking at a black head at the moment. Oh, it's probably, it's probably still is. No, 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 I've got a face now. The, the lights change during this talk. So yeah, the, uh, the number of types of tests you can yeah, do. Yeah, so right? I, I have, yeah. I've got an autoimmune disease, Sjogren syndrome, and every year yeah. I have blood tests, and they yeah. take two or three blood samples. Yeah. Um, and then on the sheet, there's a number of tests they're trying to check for. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I presume you've got to say, you can't say, right, I'm gonna, here's, a, here's a sample of blood, tell me everything that's wrong with it. You've no, got no. to target that test, is that right? You, that is correct, yes. Yeah. So the clinician will hopefully from your symptoms, you know, be, be thinking, oh, it could be this area, and then will uh, order those particular tests yeah i'm interested in what you said because we had a kit to do with that but it was a very very specialist kit and i can't remember anymore what it was all about um uh, because it's quite unusual isn't it yes it is and particularly males is uh, yes most mostly female so yeah. one in ten are male so i'm one of the lucky yeah. few yeah. um but it wasn't it, it it's very difficult to pick up um, I had it for 10 years before it was picked up, mm. and that's yeah. quite normal. Um, yes. So that, that's really my question about you can't sort of just send out blood and say, right, test for anything. Everything's wrong with that blood. It's got to no, be no, targeted. No, no. you know, someone's got to target your test. Yes. Yeah, yes, they do. And I think that autoimmunity is far more common than is realised. Yeah. And one hope, I mean, the... Because everything has changed and immunology has moved on, I would hope that modern immunologists would be looking for things far earlier and that, and that GPs in their training would actually be, be suggested this is something you need to consider. Now, my, my, my youngest son's just doing his F1 at Bury St Edmunds Hospital but at the age of 32 because he's a did postgrad med school after being a pharmacist. And I must ask him that, what immunology he got taught at med school but he did do a three-week elective here in immunology so he has he knows about it um and he said oh did you do that i said yes love for 15 years oh i never knew that <laughs> yeah because you were a teenager and weren't interested in me i was just the pain in your backside <laughs> yeah unfortunately i found the gp community and found the wider medical community have very little knowledge of Sjogren's mm. Um, oh, they, they, no, it is very, very specialist. It really yes. is. 
And I mean, it was one of our, what I'm going to call a really obscure kit. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we had some where we would maybe produce five a year. Yeah. <laughs> and it was in that order of magnitude, where, where, whereas there are others, we were producing 500, 500 a month. Yeah. Um, so, yes, and in one sense, it's unfortunate, but at least it's been found. Yes, indeed. Because there are people where it's never found. Um, mm. and the other thing about autoimmunity is that once you have one autoimmune, you're likely, you're more likely to get another. I mean, I have a friend who has six now, um, which and is, is terrible. It's, you know, mm. it can be really difficult autoimmune disease. It is difficult. Yeah, I, I've asked that to be checked, and uh, luckily at the moment, I've only got the one. Good. Well, and you hopefully it'll stay like that. Indeed. But, you know, a bit like we were talking about smoking earlier, you know, there's there's the average in the population and then there's the individual. So yep. let's hope you're the individual who bucks the trend and only has one. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Um, let's move on to uh, Ronnie, if you'd like to unmute. Thank you. Um, uh, mine's a very simple question. Um, I know nothing about chemistry, so... Is the recording going to be available to go through it again? And uh, also the film clip that was on at the beginning, because I'd like to, uh, you know, go through the whole program again. Mm. I thought that film clip was the classy bit of the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh, Robert Bernati. Right. Thank you. How's um, your castle? Yeah. But it will, it will be available, won't it? On the website. Oh, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank yes. you. And, and the Amoeba Sisters. Or a link to it. Yeah. Or a link. Yeah, so it can be a link to the Amoeba Sisters. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Robert. Right. Well, I have a question about proteins rather than the uh, work, the work that you were doing. Yeah. Um, in India, they have a lot of cobra snakes, mm. um, and uh, I think the venom is a neurotoxin. It is. And um, there's a plant. That if you eat the plant prior to being bitten, one, uh, one of the proteins in the plant will actually bend the neurotoxin so that it will not find what the, the site that it's looking for. Mm. Um, in, in general terms, you know, would you comment on that? And how could something like that possibly come about? Right. I mean, yeah, neuro act, sorry, that the plant actually has these, you know, uh, proteins which would bend the neurotoxin. How, 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 how does something like that come about? I would say how it comes about is by chance. But, I mean, neurotoxins are incredibly useful, um, can be very useful drugs, um, and also can be very useful in biochemistry and investigating proteins and also actually in ma manufacturing. We used to use a neurotoxin as part of our manufacturing process. Um, the chances are that it's a, an enzyme in the plant that just happens to act on the neurotoxin in the appropriate place that it can no longer bind in its host and cause all the problems. That is generally what you get out of plants. But it's, it, it's yet again an enzyme catalyzing some change in the neurotoxin to basically to denature it and, yeah. and it'll be chart just total chance that you know it, it, it it'll be in the plant for a completely different reason but you know what i've said you know or, and, and the amoeba says you know lipases split lipids amylases split starches proteases split starches ligases split quite general things um and and in that sense proteins can be uh, sorry enzymes can be quite general and it's, it's just happens that that plant has something in the axon the neurotoxin and you could have a bit of evolution going on couldn't you there um so so what do you mean by that well it's it's, it's just because it's in an area where that particular snake is um, because i mean sn snakes tend to be in quite a small area don't don't they unfortunately not in the uk um that because that because it was found that that plant um pr produces this as i said yes an enzyme that neutralizes the um 
neurotoxin that there's just sort of like the, pop, the population probably of people there have become aware <laughs> that uh, so it's not really evolution, but the population of people have become aware that that plant is beneficial and probably make sure it grows well. Um, I mean, I do. I mean, I'd be interested to know what happens to the snake. What happened to the snake population over the years there? Because it's if it can't actually kill its prey, it's not going to have a very happy life, is it? <laughs> well, I, I, I think the, you know the, the the issue is that you need to eat this plant a couple of hours before you're bit, yeah. right? Yeah. Which obviously nothing's going to do, or you know. Well, yeah, well, to be honest, even if you haven't. I, I jolly well shove as much of it down my throat as I could the moment I was bitten because it would make a difference. It might, it might make a difference between survival and death, even if you had a very unpleasant journey staying alive. Mm. But obviously, if you, if you have it beforehand, well, it, then that's great. But I mean, it, it could, I mean, it might be a staple food for some animal within the area that never, ever gets... <laughs> I mean, is, is there any other animal which is in vast numbers there <laughs> because, because it eats that plant and therefore it can never be killed by a snake? I mean, no, this is specific to the cobra family of snakes. Yeah. yeah. So, and I think there's plenty of other, um, mm. you know, deadly snakes in India as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. which is why I suspect it's, it, 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 it's, it's an enzyme that just happens to bind to the neurotoxin. Mm. Yeah. And that, that, that is chance, really. Yeah, okay. Finally, I just ask you this. Can you, can you just explain? You're saying that an enzyme is a type of catalyst. Yeah, an, 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 yes, an enzyme is a protein catalyst that will bring about chemical reactions at body temperature. Because if it was a normal chemical reaction, you would be in the hundreds of degrees centigrade. In chemistry, in biochemistry, it all has to happen at normal biological temperatures. You know, if this is going on in a lizard on a cold day, well, it'll all take longer because lizards don't move very fast in the cold. But you know, but but with us, it's all it, it, at thirty-seven degrees. Yeah, all the time we have chemical reactions going on that without those could not happen because you'd be over you'd be in over hundred degrees centigrade. I mean, I, I did I. I loathed organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry. I hated it with a vengeance, which is why I never did chemical engineering like I first thought. But, but normal chemistry, everything is at high temperature. Right. And the human in the body, it has to be at body temperature. And that's the amazing thing about proteins catalyzing chemical reactions. Yeah. Thank you very um, much. Carol, I have to respond to your direct insult there. Um, I, I, I found um, uh, well, I found the chemistry was uh, pretty interesting, but um, the non non organic was more interesting than yeah. the organic, yeah. and that's why I became a chemical engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it, it wasn't it wasn't an insult at all. I assure you. No, no, I'm it. joking. I'm joking. Thanks <laughs> but, very but, much. But do, do you know? I was seriously, seriously looking at it yeah. because my brother was doing biochemistry, and I just didn't want to do exactly the same as him. And then one day I twigged that I hated all these, you know, all the German named processes for water gas. And so <laughs> I loathed them with a bench. I hated right. um, in the, the inorganic analysis because it never worked. And, and, and I just adored organic chemistry because I just loved, the, you know, the, 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 the um, chemistry of the carbon atom. I'd like and, to bring and, in uh, and, Diane now, Carol, if yeah. that's okay. That's right. Uh, she's been waiting patiently. Would you like to go ahead, Diane? Well, first of all, uh, thanks, Carol. Um, uh, very interesting. I'm with you. Uh, I trained as a biochemist. And mm. uh, so as far as I'm concerned, or inorganic chemistry was awful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good job we've got a lot of Roberts in the world, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank uh, you. I, <laughs> I, I have a, a question. I, I spent a, a considerable portion of my working life uh, developing serological tests for infectious diseases for yeah. research and clinical purposes, some of which went on to be commercialized. 
The biggest problem um, ELISA developers like me had was uh, establishing the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this must have been, I mean, this was bad enough in an academic and clinical environment. This must have been even more difficult in a commercial environment like yours. Um, how, do, how did you go about this and how important was it for the tests that you developed and commercialized? Well, well t two strings to that. One, my boss had his own research facility. Ah. Right. And so, and also he collaborated with a lot of academics, <clears throat> not in the UK, because in the UK they didn't like people with private facilities, but across the world, ma mainly Japan, mainly Japan, but we, and, and, and the US as well. So we had access to a lot of clinical sa samples, um, which very fortunately, after, you know, we've been talking about sample size, we usually could get to in about 25 millilitres at a time, which, if used very carefully, were extremely useful. Now, my, my job, one of well, one of my many jobs, was to see e mark all our kits, and also to generate the technical information that the FDA wanted to uh, register them. Because whatever you wanted, the FDA would always do it completely differently. I think just out of spite. Um, you know, wh why the world can't have one basic testing regime, I don't know, but it doesn't. Um, so we just put through thousands of samples. For, and let me just explain about specificity and sensitivity of an in vitro diagnostic kit. You're looking for, you're looking, you, what you don't want is false positives or false negatives. No kit is 100% perfect. Um, but, but so sensitivity is measuring how many false, well, false positives there are. So obviously, but, but so say, say if you've got a seven se sensitivity of 95%, out of 100 samples, um, you will get 95 correct measurements, right? And five that are incorrect. And that is just life. There's nothing you can do to change it. You're dealing with biochemicals, you're dealing with life. It's like dealing with human beings. We're, we're, we're not made all, we're not all the same and there will be variation. Specificity is you're actually trying to, you're looking at how many um, of the samples which don't have your analyte in, therefore are normal, are normal. So if you have a 90% specificity out of 100 samples, 90 will come out as being normal, no analyte in. The other 10 will have a certain amount of analyte measured, even though in theory it should not be there. Um, and, and so that's how we dealt. One, one, we collaborated with a lot of academics around the world, but not the UK. Well, that's not quite fair. We, 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 there's a very good immunology department. <sighs> Actually, we got a lot of, we did, we, we did, because they bought a lot of our kits and we helped people technically, we did get a fair few samples from um, a lot of the university hospitals in the UK as well. But in terms of large quantities, they tended to come from Japan and the States, basically. And in the States, like all the normal samples in the States, which you buy in, they're, 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 they're students and they're prisoners. And they're, and, and they're nearly all white male. And the, the difficulty actually is getting hold of samples from other um, ethnic backgrounds. Yeah. That's very and, difficult. And gendered biases as well. There are vast gender biases, yes. You would get 90% male. And the only times when there weren't gender biases were when, when there were actual patient samples, unless there's a gender bias within the disease and for the patient. But, but, but for normals, it's very hard. Um, because I used to have to do a breakdown for the FDA of the eth ethnic origin and 95% would be white male mm. and, and you get, then the rest, most of them were black and then you get one or two Asians. Mm. Yeah. Um, but, and, you know, uh, but, 
sorry i was just going to say the problem's even worse and with someone like uh, our colleague that had sogar and syndrome to mm. to find enough population with mm. defined defect disease and, mm. and then uh, age sex match them against uh, normal population is, mm. is incredibly difficult these tests are very difficult to establish and, and <laughs> That's right. They are very, very difficult. And, 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 and my boss who owned the company was very, very careful to, to, about nurturing good relationships with labs, working with patient samples from very obscure diseases yeah. for that very reason. And sometimes you just have to give it your best shot. OK, we've only got 10 patient samples, but we can do... 200 300 normals mm. what's it showing us because because i mean sometimes we, we would do specialist testing as, as um research but the doctors were desperate and they said look do your best you might be able to help us mm. we never produce a kit but we could do the biochemistry yeah time for moving on uh ladies thank you for that uh diane and carol i've got one uh question from andrew klein in the chat box uh who says i assume the cassette based tests like uh, the covid test are based on elisa how are the enzymes stabilized to survive long-term storage at room temperature what well, when you say cassette test i'm wondering well, the, what the, the little plastic Lateral flow test. The lateral flow test. Yeah. The lateral flow test. Yes. Well, they're dry. Proteins are stable when they're dry at room temperature. It's, it's just okay. like blotting paper with, with, with strips of, of course, protein yeah, and antibodies on. Yeah. And, and I mean, oh. I, I heard David Davis say, of course, everybody knows they're no good. And I thought, you're an MP who doesn't know what you're talking about. Given the time they had to develop the lateral flow test, they are very, very good yeah i agree yeah, and, and if you have three if you have three negative lateral flow tests in terms of the population it's you're highly likely to be negative there'll always be the exception who always pipes up who's probably written to david davis however they are excellent and in fact all these tests are amazing when you think of the time frame in which they were developed as are the vaccines yeah. I mean, n nobody would ever have developed an ax vaccine that has to be stored at minus 80. It's absolutely lunatic. Yeah. It was the first one to hit the market. Like, uh, this is the American one, was it? <laughs> and I mean, because, and it's no use in somewhere like in, in the third world because they haven't got the cold chains. But in the UK, it's OK. But of, of course, you know, the um, anything that you can store at fridge temperature is fine. But it's it's but the, the lateral flow test is pure everything is dry yeah understood uh robert is it a quick a real one? quick one i was just going to say that apparently what you had was that um in the early days of those lateral flow tests some kids had come up with the the uh, solution that if they spilled coca-cola on the test it would actually give them a positive and then they could get a week off school or a couple of weeks yeah. of school. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, know yeah I, I, down I, on it. I know you're down on it, but I think that that is absolutely amazing chemistry. Yeah, yeah I, I must be, I, I read that and I thought it was absolutely hilarious. And I, but I haven't worked out what it, the Coca-Cola's reacting with. <laughs> but it's obviously something in Coca-Cola. Um, I mean, because it really, literally is a strip, a strip of blotting paper with, um, you know, proteins bound to it in a, two little lines. And the top strip, the test strip that always goes blue, has got the antibody and the antigen in it. Yeah. Whereas the middle strip, the, the test strip, just has the um, antibody in it. So there's something in Coca-Cola that mimics the antigen of the spike protein, which I think, I mean, Coca-Cola ought to patent it for something or other. <laughs> well, hang on a minute. I'm not sure if it is actually, you know, specific to Coca-Cola. I mean, it might be that all of the colas work. It might be. Yeah. It I mean, may well other? be, yeah. Yeah, what other? 
Yeah. No, no, I, I know nothing about cola chemistry, okay? <laughs> Don't run in short. It's a secret uh, formula uh, that's uh, sort of, I don't know, spread over <laughs> seven safes or something like that, so nobody yeah. else does either. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Time's running short uh, now, Carol. I know, um, yeah. I know Barry has something for us shortly, but first of all, I'd like us all please to thank Carol for a great presentation this morning and a great set of answers to uh, the questioning. Stood up very well Thank indeed. You. Thank you, Carol. Well done. Very well done.